In this video, I will be talking about shallow feed-forward neural networks for graph processing. Graphs correspond to a very general form of data representation. One of the reasons for this is that any set of objects can be represented as a graph with a similarity function. In this representation, objects correspond to nodes and similarity values correspond to weights of edges between these nodes. Now, these objects could be of any type. They could be multidimensional objects, they could be categorical objects, they could be sequences, or they could even be time series. The main point is that you just need to be able to define a similarity function among them, and then you can represent any set of objects as a graph. Now, this type of generality of the graph representation also makes it more challenging than other data domains as far as neural network processing is concerned. Now, there are two main scenarios as far as graph learning is concerned. One scenario is that of a single large graph. The single large graph is encountered in cases such as the web, social networks, or information networks, where you have one very large graph and you have individual nodes corresponding to actors or objects in this graph. And the focus in this type of learning is that of creating multidimensional representations of nodes. In other words, a neural network is used in order to create node representations. The second graph learning scenario is that of many small graphs. One example of this type of scenario is that of chemical compounds. In this case, the focus is that, is that of creating a representation of the entire graph. So for example, you may want to create a multidimensional representation of a particular type of molecule, say a benzene molecule, once you represent it as a graph. Now, there are also different types of architectures that are used in graph processing. The first type of architecture is the most straightforward type, which is that of extending conventional feed-forward networks for node-level representation in single large graphs. So imagine you have a single large graph for one to a social network or an information network, and you want to find the representations of nodes. And it turns out that you can use your traditional feed-forward network in order to create this representation. That is the focus of this presentation. Now, this type of approach, of course, is not very commonly used in graph processing. The more common approach in graph processing, which uh, many of you might have heard of, is that of using convolutional graph neural networks. These types of uh, methods, they typically use convolutional operations on the neighborhood of a node, and they are generalizations of convolutional neural networks which are used in image processing. Just as image processing uses convolutions on adjacent pixels in an image, these types of uh, graph, uh, net, graph neural networks use convolutional neural networks on the nodes of a graph. Now, uh, the, the convolutional graph neural network, just like the conventional feedforward network, is naturally designed for representation at the node level. In fact, rep creating representation at the graph level is quite challenging, but uh, these types of networks, they can be extended to the graph level. And there's a lot of research currently going on because still trying to find good representation of, of networks at the graph level, uh, it's, not, it's a problem that has not been fully solved, at least satisfactorily. So let's talk about the feed forward neural network architecture, which is the focus of this presentation. So uh, let's consider in the simplest case. So first we'll discuss the simplest case where we have an undirected adjacency matrix A is equal to AIJ with binary edges. So what do I mean by binary edges? Each of these small AIJs, it's a zero one value. So you have a matrix, the square matrix N cross N where N is your number of nodes and you have zeros and ones depending on whether an edge exists between a pair of nodes, and it's undirected, which basically means that if AIJ is one, then AJI also has to be one. Now, uh, this uh, type of shallow neural network architecture, it actually uses a model which is borrowed from word to vec which is used for creating word representations. The, the, and, and in fact, the, the original paper, when it was written, it was written with, uh, it was called note to vec because it derived a lot of its uh, motivation from the original word to vec paper. Now, the, now, in this case, the inputs and the outputs, they are both one hot encoded node identifiers. So you input a single node, a single one hot encoded node, 
and your output is a probability. So again, you, are, you, are, you have as many outputs as the number of nodes. It's, uh, and your output is a probability value, which tells you, hey, is this output node adjacent to your input node? So let's look at an example. So here I have shown an example of a base graph. This base graph is undirected, uh, the, the one on the left. It's got five nodes. And let's say that we want to input node three. The corresponding neural network is shown on the right. Now you can see that the input, uh, there are five inputs that corresponds to the five nodes. The input is one hot encoded. What does that mean? Only one of these values is a one and all others are zeros. So that, and as you can see, the value corresponding to node three is a one. So that means that we are inputting node three and the outputs, uh, I've shown the ground truth output at the other end. The ground truth output contains three ones. Why does it contain three ones? As you can see, node three has three edges incident on it. That's node one, node two, and node four. So you can see on the right that uh, node one has a one, node two has a one, and node four has a one, and the other two have zero. So this is the ground truth output. Of course, when you run this input to a neural network, the, the output layer, which is a sigmoid, it's going to create probability values. And you compare these probability values with the ground truth outputs to create a loss function. So that is discussed in the next slide. So, um, uh, so, so, so what you do is that you create a sigmoid output with logarithmic loss. So each of these outputs uh, in on the right, the, the, these five outputs, one, two, three, four, five, it's a, there's a sigmoid activation function attached to it in the output layer. And it gives you a probability value and you'll use a log loss uh, corresponding to that probability. So obviously if the output is the one, you want the probability to be high. And uh, if the output uh, is low, you want the probability to be low and the log loss will take care of that. Um, so, uh, and and so, so, so that's why you have number of outputs equal to number of nodes. Now, this of course creates a problem because this is very expensive because uh, note that we are you, considering a scenario, we have a single large graph. So it could be a very large social network with millions of nodes, which basically means you have millions of outputs. Now, one important point is that most of these graphs such as social networks or information networks, they are typically very sparse. That means most of the values are zeros and there are small number of ones corresponding to the friends of a particular node in the network. So what you do is that you don't actually calculate the loss function from all of the nodes. You sample the zero outputs in proportion to their node degrees. Why in proportion to, to their node degrees? Because the node degree tells you uh, in some sense the importance of that node. So the probability of a sampling of a node is proportional to its node degree. And uh, you, you keep all of the one output. So the aggregate loss is over sampled outputs. Uh, and, and after aggregating this loss, uh, you, you can create a loss function. Now note that by this type of sampling, you're changing the model slightly because you're weighting the nodes corresponding to zero values less <coughs> than the nodes corresponding to one value. This is in general, not a problem. And the reason that it's not a problem is because in general, zero values are less important than the one value. So the presence of edges is typically more important than the absence of edges. So um, uh, now you can extend this to the case of weighted edges. So, so, so in, in the case of weighted edges, you have non-zero outputs, uh, which are, so you have, you have your weights associated with the edges. So, so what you do is that you create, you, 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 you have non-zero outputs, which are sampled in proportional to the edge weights. So, and, and, and the zero output. So, so, so the outputs that correspond to one values, the output that correspond to edges that are present, that, that has a non-zero weight, you sample them in proportion to the edge weights and the zero outputs, you sample them in proportion to, to their weighted node degree. So this is very similar to the previous case, except that you're also sampling the non-zero edges. And now, uh, you can actually control this sampling because you can sample the non-zero uh, nodes and the zero node. Non-zero nodes are nodes that, that are incident to your input node. 
and the zero nodes are the ones that are not incident to your input node. You can you can sample them at in different ratios, and uh, and in a sense uh, that that controls relative importance of the presence and absence of edges. So that that way you can actually control your trade-off between the your false positives and the false negatives. Now. You can extend this type of approach to collective classification. So in collective classification, a subset of nodes in the graph are labeled with one of M classes. And the goal is to predict the class of the unlabeled nodes. So what you do in this case is that you use a, exactly the same architecture that we discussed before, except that you add additional softmax output that predict the class label. Uh, and these additional softmax outputs are connected to the uh, hidden layer. So we can go back and I can show you uh, what it looks like. So, so here, for example, uh, uh, in addition to the output nodes, you will have additional outputs corresponding to the class label. And that, uh, and this class label will be attached to the hidden layer. And, and then what you will do, you'll have a loss function that sums up over uh, both the edge prediction, like you had last time, and the class prediction losses. And in fact, uh, this is kind of like a semi-supervised approach because the edge prediction is kind of the unsupervised portion and the class prediction is the supervised portion. So it's semi-supervised approach. And of course, uh, you can choose different weights for the edge prediction, class prediction, depending on what gives you the most accuracy on holdout data. Uh, now, uh, one can extend this model further to incorporate additional node features. So, uh, so, so the idea here is that in some cases, your nodes may, uh, may have features associated with it. So for example, in a social network, you may have age, uh, interest, pro user profile, all these features attached to it. And you want to use these features to enhance your node representation. So what you can do is that you can add input nodes corresponding to features that feed into the hidden layer. And you can add the output nodes that connect the output features to hidden layer. And, and what you can do, you can use a squared loss between the input and the output features. And this can, of course, be extended to multiple edge types as well for knowledge graphs. So I'm going to give you an example of an architecture uh, where this uh, where, where we have nodes with different edge types. So again, I'm using the same example as I used last time. It's the same graph of five nodes, except that now you can see you have edge types associated with nodes. So you have edge types A, B, C, and D. And, and what you do is that now you, you'll also have some features associated with node, node with each node. So with node three, you, you might have different features associated, associated with it, like your age, user profile, depending on your social network features of that user. So the inputs and outputs are modified to take this into account. So first of all, you have an additional set of inputs, which are node features. So suppose we are inputting node three. So as you can see on the left, I'm inputting node three because you have one hot encoded inputs where you have a value of one on node three. Now the input node features will correspond to the features of node three and the output features at the other end, at the other symmetric end again will be features of node three. The other output will be the adjacent edges to node three together with their edge type. So as you can see on the outputs for node one, the output is B, uh, for node two, the output is A, and for node four, the output is C. But for nodes three and five, the outputs are zero because those nodes are not incident on nodes three. Now, now, now again, note that the output is categorical, so you can use one-hot encoding on the different edge types in order to create uh, create a loss function, a softmax loss function, and and that's exactly how this is done. Now. Uh, you can extend a lot of what we have discussed before by using hand, handcrafted feature engineering. So, so the neural network architecture we have, which we have discussed so far, it uses the immediate connectivity between nodes to create input-output pairs. That means you, you, we are using the individual edges. Now, using indirect connect connectivity, that is pathwise connectivity, makes it more informat informative. So what we do is that we take our original graph 
and we change its input edge weights with the use of random walks. So the random walks, by performing random walks and finding what the weight of a random walk is between two nodes, we can change the weights on the edges and use these modified weights with exactly the same model. So the weight of an edge between two nodes is modified to be the number of times that the, that one node occurs in a short random walk starting at the other node and vice versa. So, uh, so, 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 so let's say that the number of random walks of length k between nodes i and j, you want to use that. In that case, it can be shown that you can take the adjacency matrix, raise it to the kth power, and its ijth entry is just will just give you the number of random walks of length k between nodes i and j. But we don't really want that. What we want is a decay weighted walk. We want all kinds of lengths and we want to decay the importance of the random walk when the length becomes too long. And the way that's done is with the use of the cards measure. So instead of using a to the power of k, first I multiply a with alpha, where alpha is a decay factor between zero and one. So now you have a downweighted adjacency matrix and you raise it to the ith power. So now you have a, have a decay weighted walk of length i and you add it from one through infinity. So, so you are considering walks of all possible length. Uh, now, of course, even though it's an infinite summation, it turns out that for appropriate values of, of alpha, you can express this in closed form. That's shown, in, shown on the right-hand side of equation one. So this A alpha is your new adjacency matrix. So all you do in this approach is you take your original adjacency matrix, replace it with A alpha, and then you apply the entire process that we discussed in the previous slides. That's the only difference. Now, one comment on the random walk method is that it's a form of feature engineering. So it is done in order to improve, improve the input uh, representation. And what this feature engineering really does is that it compensates for the shallow nature of the underlying neural networks. And the primary purpose of depth really uh, in traditional neural networks is to engineer, engineer increasingly sophisticated features with, with each layer of depth. In this case, we use random walks to compensate for it. And it does tend to work quite well. It, in fact, it works surprisingly well. And there are some studies which show that it does almost as well as conventional graph neural network, though that is also a question. So that is not a settled issue. <laughs> But uh, the important point is that this type of handcrafting goes against the grain of the end-to-end -end approach of neural networks. Now, the conv uh, convolutional graph neural network, they directly use the structure of the graph in the learning process across multiple layers. And that's just like convolutional neural networks in image data. And uh, that will be the discuss of uh, subsequent videos in this series.